Good evening. It's time for us to gather together and worship God once again. Um, do want to remind everyone, make sure you get a copy of the handout if you didn't this morning or earlier before you came in. There are several announcements and updates that are going on uh, that you need to be made aware of. And uh, um, one of the things that we do want to make sure that you are aware of is there, there seemed to be a little bit of misunderstanding as far as moving forward with the proposed uh, format change that was brought up. There is no format change other than uh, we have new classes that will begin in October offered to our adult classes. Times remain the same of 9 o'clock for Bible class in the morning and 10 o'clock a.m. worship. So I want to encourage everyone to still maintain and come to those. Evening worship will remain the same as has been. Um, and so keep up to keep up with that. The elders do have a handout that there were copies in the back. They were passed out during Bible class this morning. If, you, if there are no more copies or you have questions, please make sure to find an elder. And with that handout are the descriptions of the adult classes. Uh, look at the teachers who are teaching each class. And if you have a question about specifics, please go to those teachers, ask some questions, because there may be uh, more to that class than meets the eye. And so please, we want to encourage everyone to be involved with that as we try to encourage spiritual growth and as we try to grow the church, both spiritually and numerically, and we try to be the best Christians that God has desired for us to be. As we come together to worship, we'll be open in prayer here in a moment by Alan Dillard. Uh, Justin Lindley has our song leading. Mark Henderson will read our scripture. Alan has our lesson, and we'll be closed out in prayer by our brother Gene Owens. Thank you for being here. Even though it's a little wet outside, it's bright and shiny in here. 
And that's not just my head. That's your smiling faces. Let's get started with a word of prayer. Bow with me, please. Our God and Father in heaven, as we bow at this time, we're grateful for the day that you blessed us with, and we're grateful for the time that we have to assemble as the church. We pray as we assemble this evening that the things that we do and say will be in accordance with your will and bring you glory and honor which you richly deserve. We're mindful of some of our number who are sick. Some are traveling to seek procedures. We're grateful for those that have been blessed with the recovery. Pray that you continue to be with them. We're mindful of Will and Cody as they're away in the youth program. Pray that that would go well and they would have a safe trip home. We're grateful for the church that meets here from time to time, especially mindful of our elders at this time. Pray that you'd grant them wisdom as they lead the flock, that the things that they decide that we will do will bring glory and honor and help the church to expand its borders. We're grateful for Alan and his ability to proclaim the word. Pray that you'd be with him this evening and help him to have a good recollection of the things that he's prepared for us. And be with us as we listen, that we might apply the lesson to our lives and be better examples for Christ in this world. We're grateful for the church, the church the world over. We know that it is the body of Christ. Pray that you should always be with it and help you to remain true to the cause. Pray that there'd never be any error come from this congregation or any of your church. Ask you to continue with us through life. We're grateful for the blessings of this country, especially the blessing of freely assembling to worship thee and pray that we'd always be mindful of that. There are men and women who serve in the armed forces that protect this country and pray that you'd continue to be with them, that they might be safe. We know that there are times that we fail to do the things that you would have us to do and pray that you'd forgive us of those things. Help us to be stronger. Now continue with us and help us to be mindful that without Christ none of this would be possible. And it's through his name that we pray. And amen. If you're using your books this evening, our first song will be number 515, number 515 on Zion's Glorious Summit. We'll sing uh, first and last of this song. On Zion's Glorious Summit.
Next song this evening before Alan's lesson is going to be number 589. Number 589. If you'd like to stand as we sing this song. Sing. Uh, first and third verses of worship reading and Alan's lesson. Are you so Our Bible reading tonight comes from Matthew 13, starting in verse 3 and going down to verse 9. Matthew 13, 3 through 9. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places, where they had not much earth. And forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But others fell into good ground, and brought forth fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. I uh, appreciate Justin leading that last song. It's good to have somebody figure out kind of what you're talking about and do a song that kind of goes with the subject. I always think when I sing that song, though, you have to be careful where you take your breath because it could be, are you sowing the seed of the king, dumb brother? And we need to make sure that, you know, that's not the way it comes across. So uh, just be careful where you breathe on that first line. I thought about this lesson, thought about doing something like this when we announced last week that the garden was going to be pulled up yesterday and all of that stuff and there won't be any more vegetables harvested. Now the, the okra patch over here is still going strong, but uh, the tomatoes and all that I'm, I, I assume are done. And so that got me thinking. And so, you know, I thought we'd kind of look at Jesus as the farmer who never plowed a field because he indeed is a farmer, but, you know, he didn't, he didn't, I don't say he didn't understand, he never experienced physical farming that we know of. When he came to earth, he laid aside his royal robe, though, and he donned the dress of the common man. And when you think about it, he laid down the scepter and he picked up a carpenter's hammer. He gave up stardust for sawdust. He exchanged the singing of angels for the pounding of nails. He went from framing worlds to framing houses. His hands were calloused by hours of physical labor. He could talk, and this is something you may not, but if he was a carpenter, he could talk about plumb lines, square feet, and estimated dates of completion. 
He was a carpenter, but he could have been anything else because he, of all people, was not limited by natural talent or opportunity. This was God coming into this world in the flesh. Had it been the Father's plan, he could have been anything. And I have no doubt, as a human being, he had to learn the skills of carpentry. Now, we don't have any reference to him, you know, practicing being a carpenter, but if he was a typical Jewish boy growing up, he generally, they would learn the trade of their father. And his father, we do know, his earthly father at least, was a carpenter. So I have to believe that from an early age, he was out there in the shop, helping out, understanding, measuring twice, cutting once, and so on. You know, that's, that's what he did. And he had to learn those skills, but just from what we know about Jesus from the Word, we know that he was going to be a carpenter unto his Father, just like his Word tells us. Work as unto the Lord, not just for your employer, not just for your company or the boss. Work to please God. And when my physical labor, my mental labor, that for, with which I earn a paycheck is done as though it was being done for God, you can generally rest assured you are going to please whoever your employer may be. But let's look at Jesus, this farmer that never plowed a field. First of all, we talk about the sower. Luke chapter 8, verse 5. The sower went out to sow his seed. See, that's what a sower does. That's not any profound statement, but one who sows, sows seed. That's what he does. And so it would have been logical for Jesus, if he had wanted to, to be a farmer. Because think about it. He's the one. You remember Genesis 8, verse 22, after the flood, and God promised that from here on out, as long as the earth stands, there will be seed time and harvest? Who do you reckon set that whole thing in motion? Oh, John chapter 1, verse 3, talking about Christ. All things were made through him, and without him was then nothing made there. There was nothing made that was made without Christ. And we know it's talking about Christ because verse 14 says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He is the one. He was the executor of the Father's plan for the physical creation. He's the one that set this hydrological or whatever cycle in place and the rain and the seasons and all of that. And he's the one that put life into the seeds. You go in Genesis chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the herb that yields seed and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed, according to its kind, the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself, according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. So it would have made a lot of sense, really. It would have been very logical if when Jesus came, he had been a farmer. He made the earth fertile. He made trees fruitful. He made vegetables edible. He invented the water cycle and gave the former and the latter rains in the time of harvest. You go to the wise man's writings, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 7, all the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place from which the rivers come, there they return again. Now that was a scientific principle that I assure you Solomon didn't fully grasp, but that's the idea. The water evaporates and goes back up into the sky, and then it comes back down in the form of rain, and it's just a constant cycle. Jesus is the one that put that in place. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 24, they do not say in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God who gives rain, both the former and the latter, in its season. He reserves for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. And then again, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, Jesus said, you need to be more like your Father in heaven because he sent the rain on the just and the unjust. So God Almighty, Father, Son, Spirit, God, sends the rain. He did all this. He is the reason that we have food to eat. He is the reason that the garden out there produced the tomatoes and the, the okra and the squash and the beans 
Now, I don't know who's to blame for the lack of cucumbers. Well, we won't go there, but the re, you know, he's the one that made it possible. And so, you know, he could have been a farmer, but as far as we know, Jesus never pushed a plow, nor picked a tomato, never inhaled the scent of newly turned earth, nor felt the sweat run down his back as he picked beans in July. He never smiled as the first bud broke the ground in spring or sighed as the last wagon load came out of the field in the fall because he wasn't a farmer. He, in fact, was a carpenter up until he became an itinerant traveling preacher. Nevertheless, he is still the sower that went out to sow. In Mark chapter 4, verse 8, his seed, some produced a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. In fact, shortly after his ascension back to heaven, he watched from the right hand of the throne of the Father as his seed produced 3,000 souls on his side. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Then they that gladly received the word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. So he could have been a farmer, and he was in a way, but not a physical farmer. He was a spiritual sower who sowed the seed. So what's involved in that that Jesus did? What's involved in it for us? Well, for one thing, for Christ, he started with, and this is pretty much what you got to do if you're going to be a farmer, if you're going to, you know, go out there and plant, you got to have ground. You either got to rent, buy something. Jesus bought him a farm. That's one thing he did. In fact, his farm is humongous. It's the whole world. Psalm 24, verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. And you remember in Mark 16, 15, talking to his apostles, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So that's what he did. Someone calculated a whole lot sharper than I am that there are, I believe this number, is one quadrant. Anyway, the point is, if it was an average cost of $1,500 an acre, it would cost two quadrillion, actually 2.22970781424700. That's over two quadrillion dollars to buy the land that's on this planet, and that's just at $1,500 an acre. And it would most likely run quite a bit more than that nowadays, particularly with what we would call the improvements that have been made in some places. Like the old boy the Texans said, they see he was super wealthy. And they said, hey, you own a bunch of land? He said, no, nah, I've only got 10 acres. Well, where is it? Downtown Dallas. You know, so it just, you know, it depends on where that land would be as to what it's cost. But the point is he owns it all. And even if we could buy it for two quadrillion dollars, that's not what Jesus, not as much as Jesus paid. You remember Acts chapter 20, verse 28, which he purchased with his own blood. Paul talking to the elders there from Ephesus as he met with them on his way back to Jerusalem where he knew he would be arrested, Agabus having told him that by prophecy. And so he called them to the seacoast town of Miletus, and he told them, pay attention to yourselves and the whole flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd or to feed the church of God, which he, Christ, purchased with his blood. He paid the price of the blood of the only begotten Son of God. There is nothing greater than that. So he bought himself a farm. And then he sows seed. Luke chapter 8, verse 11 the seed is this, this parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Mark chapter 4, verse 14, the sower sows the word, and that word is still powerful. The word is like seed in that it seems insignificant, perhaps, but it has great power. You know, Jesus talked about you need to have faith like a mustard seed, little, little bitty tiny seed, but when you put even that little tiny seed into the ground, 
it reaches out for all of the nutrients that it can find in the dirt around it, takes advantage of all the opportunities that it has, and then it will grow into a rather large bush so big that birds can make nests in it. But it all started like a little bit tiny seed. The word sometimes may seem as insignificant, but God's word has great power. Proof, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How did he do that? He said, let there be light. And it was light. He spoke. And all of it came into existence within six 24-hour days. And you know, I've been thinking, I, I, I don't know, every now and then you know, you're out like cutting grass or on a tractor or just doing something that doesn't require a lot of mental, you know, gymnastics. And so you're thinking about other stuff. And I forget what I was doing a week or two ago, and I was thinking a lot about that. And you know how that scientists tell us that this earth is millions and millions, if not billions of years old, and the universe and all of that. And I thought, you know, really when you think about it, all of the stars, we do know, I mean, it's signed, we know how fast light travels, 186,000 miles a second. And we can know some of these stars, how many light years they are away. I mean, a bunch. And yet, their light has reached Earth. And so that's why some scientists say, well, if it took, you know, 100,000 years for that light to reach the Earth, then there, we can see that star even with it, it may take a telescope, then the universe has to be 100,000 years old at least. No, not really. Because how were Adam and Eve created? Were they babies? No. They were created capable of reproduction, which means they were created full grown. Every tree, every vegetable was created capable of reproduction, which means it was all created full grown why in the world would God have created the earth or the universe in some other state other than what he created everything that we know? So this planet created full-grown. Those stars, the universe created full-grown. I have no doubt that that light was here when God said, let's do it. Yes, we know now how long it takes, but God's God. He got it here in a hurry. So the universe may appear to be very old. They may not be tragically mistaken with everything that we can figure out, but there's no reason for us to doubt Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 because God created everything full-grown anyway. So that would include life and the universe. Romans chapter 1 verse 16, Paul wrote, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first and also to the Greek. Bottom line is, like seed, the word has power. You go out in the woods. I picked one up, in fact, just the other day because it was off an oak tree that I wasn't familiar with, and it was an acorn that I didn't even realize it was an acorn until I got my picture of this identifier app on my phone, and it told me it's a nutshell oak or something like that, I believe. And anyway, it, has, it doesn't have a regular cap on it, but it, anyway, an acorn. You got an acorn, you know, it looks harmless, and it is pretty much, but you know, you put that acorn in the ground, and with the right environmental conditions, Give it 100 years, and you can have a tremendously huge oak tree dropping thousands of acorns through the years. You know, that's the power that's in that little acorn. I mean, you look around at some of the oak trees. That's where they started. That's where they all got their start. I mean, it seems harmless, but there is power, unbelievable power. And the Word of God... Same thing, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It's living, powerful, sharper than a double-edged sword, able to separate to the piercing division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's the Word of God. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man plants, that he will also reap. If you plant or sows, if you sow to the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. If you sow to the Spirit, you will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. When I sow the Word or whatever I sow, something's going to grow. I'm either going to sow truth and obedience and faith in my life and grow into an eternal destiny with God, or I'm going to sow something else 
and I'm going to grow into and reap corruption. But don't be deceived. Whatever a man sows, he will reap. That's what he will reap, good or bad. Because there's power in what we sow, and in particular, when we sow the Word of God, there is amazing power. Because God's Word can generate new life. No other book can do that. It doesn't matter how smart the man is that might have written it. Only the Word of God contains the power to create a new spiritual life. Old things passed away. Behold, all things become new. 2 Corinthians around chapter 5, about verse 17. Only God's Word can do that. And the seed of the Word of God only grows in one place. And that's in the soil of the human heart. And now you look at Luke 8, 11 through 15. They're not going to be on the screen, but that's Luke's account of the parable of the sower. There were several different kinds of soil into which this seed fell. The seed was the good seed. In fact, Jesus said, seed's the Word of God. And as you heard read for you earlier from, from Matthew's account, you know, the point is there's some seeds, some hearts, where it looked like it was doing great, but then there wasn't much depth there. Not a lot of studying took place, not a lot of grounding. And as soon as times got tough, temptation came, whatever, sun got hot, that plant died out, and that person was gone. Others were planted in the soil of a human heart, looked like it's doing well, but then they went back to what they were involved in before, what was important to them then, the cares and the deceitfulness of riches, got more interested, forgot to put God first, and lo and behold, that got choked out. And in some of it, the heart was so hard it never even sunk in. And it just didn't grow at all. It was just immediately rejected. And there are people like that. But then some of it fell into an honest heart and produced 160, 30 fold. Different kinds of soil, same heart. And we need to get out there and plant. They were all planted in the parable from the same bag by the same sower. The variable is the soul, not the seed. And that's true to this day, isn't it? You can go out there, and even out in that garden out there with all of the, the fertilization, the watering, and everything, but if you went out there and looked, there would be rows of things. The exact same seed out of the same packet was planted in that whole row, now, it could be rabbits contributed to some of this, but there would be places where it did nothing came up. Why? Dirt must have been a little different there. Seed was good, as far as we know. The seed was the same. The Word of God, you don't have to worry about the seed being good. It's always good. It's the heart that makes the difference. And God, Jesus, the Father, the Son, is involved in our lives. You know, as a farmer, if you will. You remember John chapter 15, verses 1 and 2? He says, I'm the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And those branches that are bearing fruit, God prunes them so they'll bear more fruit. That's telling me that as long as I'm living for God in one way or another through his providence or something, he is involved in my life. He cares about what I'm doing. He cares about what we're doing. And he wants us to be even more successful in his service, in his son's kingdom, in planting this seed into the soil of human hearts. And through his providence, he can work out things for our good, Romans chapter 8. And doors can be opened if we will walk through to where people are, we are given the opportunity to plant this seed and pray and nurture and water, as Paul said, he and Apollos and so on, and let God give the increase. And we have the opportunity to do it. That's what Jesus came to do. He came to give his life, and in giving his life, he left us his message, his word, so that we can have like he did. He came and sowed seed while he was here on this planet, and then gave his life and sent the comforter, the Holy Spirit, to guide these men to share the rest of what this seed would be. And now we are his hands and feet, if you will, out in the fields of human hearts, 
sowing the seed of the Word of God. And we need to be involved when we do that in the harvest. See, Jesus wants to pick you and me as a choice fruit and store us in his celestial barn forever. Matthew chapter 13, verse 30. You remember the parable was that they sowed good seed, but an enemy came and sowed, sowed tares or weeds in there. And when the servants saw it, you want us to go pull them up? No, you may hurt the good stuff. So let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares or the weeds, bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Jesus wants me and you to be the wheat, not the weeds. And he wants us to take the seed that produced us, the Word of God, and plant that in other people's hearts so that they too can be gathered into his barn. Now I realize, John chapter 14, you know, we talk about and we sing the song, you know, the mansions. And there's no doubt in my mind, I don't know how it's going to look or work, but heaven will be the equivalent of a mansion. But I'm going to be honest with you. I'd settle for a barn up in heaven. Jesus just puts me there after he harvests me, and I'm going to be just fine with that. You know, for someone who never plowed a field, Jesus was a pretty good farmer. Still is. And he wants us to be as well. Am I sowing the seed of the kingdom? Am I doing that every opportunity that I have and even striving to create opportunities to do that? Because the more seed that's sown, the more harvest will be gathered. Don't sow the seed, you don't get a harvest. And I was out Friday all day on my tractor with the tiller behind it, turning up dirt in anticipation of planting some seed and hoping that it comes up. But I assure you, if I don't go back and do anything else, something will come up. I know the dirt, but it'll be weeds. It won't be what I want. If I want to have the harvest to come up that I want, I'm going to have to go back and plant the seed that will produce the crop that I'm looking for. And I may have to pull some weeds in the process. That's what it takes if you want to get out of the literal dirt what you want to get. There's no reason to believe that it's any different in a spiritual harvest. If I don't plant the seed in another human's heart, there will be no harvest. And sometimes I need to help them to kind of pull the weeds of false doctrine out of that heart so that the true word has access to all the opportunities that are presented to grow. But I can't do that if I don't know the truth and if I don't practice the truth and if I don't study the truth and not just study it to know it, but study it and then study human nature and learn how to present that truth to another human being in an effective way. And when I do that, I'm going to be the, the most successful farmer that I can be. And that's exactly what God wants for all of us. And if a response tonight would help enhance that opportunity, just come down front while we stand and sing.
little golf. We know it well enough we can keep on singing. That's the kind of invitation song I'm looking for. And it was actually an invitation song. Thank you. Um, okay, Sedema Pool is in room 101. I think we talked about this in my class some, this morning at uh, NHC over in Moulton. If you want to send her a card, look up the address for that. Um, okay, and apparently I knew she, she had had, they thought, a stroke, but it looks like now, I knew when I talked to her a few days ago, she was wearing a monitor. So it appears that she maybe had a mild heart attack and uh, they don't know if they need to do surgery. Or who am I talking about now? This is Lorraine. Ah, oh, Lorraine, it appears she, who wrote this? Okay, um, I'm sorry. When I saw at the bottom as it John was with, I thought, wait a minute, I think we're talking about Lorraine, aren't we? Is she at Decatur Morgan? Okay, I'm sorry, Lorraine perhaps had a mild heart attack and so they don't know if they need to do surgery or monitoring I'm assuming they're checking to see if it's a result of blockage or something to that effect. And if it is, they'll put in a stent or do, I guess, a bypass. And, uh, but anyway, John is with her. We don't have a room. Well, she's probably not in a room yet if it just happened. So uh, keep up with that if you want to. Uh, hopefully we'll know something tomorrow in the office. If you need more info on that, call, and I'm sure Angie will know or one of us will surely. But I apologize. Sedema so Pool is in NHC and Moulton 101 end of that announcement. Lorraine perhaps had a mild heart attack, and so they're trying to decide what's the best uh, avenue to take to treat her. And we're going to sing a closing song, and while we're doing this, if you didn't have a chance to take the Lord's Supper this morning, you can exit that way and follow Sam, and he will show you where you can go to observe that. Or is there anything else we need to mention that before we dismiss closing the song and a prayer? All right. Thanks again for your attention, your attendance. See you back here at this point still for a couple of more weeks, 7 o'clock, Wednesday night. Our closing song tonight will be number 76, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. We'll sing the first and last verse of this song and then be dismissed in prayer. Blessed be the tie. Let us pray together. My Lord, God, and Father in heaven, thank you, O Lord, for the blessings of life that you have shared with us today, for watching over and keeping us safe. Thank you for Jesus, for his death on the cross, that we might have this hope of eternal life with you. Thank you for our health. Thank you for your mercy and grace. And ask you, O oh Lord, as we walk through this week, this day, and this week, that you'd walk with us and guide us our footsteps. Help those that have health problems, and help us to help those that we're able to find out about. Strengthen us and keep us safe. In that lane, we pray. Amen. <laughs>